Good evening, folks, and welcome to another episode of the Cover One Film Room, part of the Cover One Sports Network. I am one of your three hosts, Anthony Proaska, joined tonight by Eric Turner, joined tonight by Kendall Mursky. And much like last week, we have a member of the Buffalo Bills in the Cover One Film Room with us. And much like last week, I am once again overshadowed by another tremendous beard. Last week, it was Mitch Morse. This week, it is Ryan Bates. Offensive guard slash offensive tackle slash center slash do it all kind of everything on the offense. I prefer line. athlete. Okay. Oh, fair okay. Enough. Fair yeah. Enough. Okay. Respect. Enough. I'm not gonna lie. We I we talked about teeing that up. I was like, I want to know what he wants to be introduced as. We'll see what he says. And so there <laughs> we go. Athlete. I mean, you know, the what best answer. Sense? It is the best answer. It is good. And, you know, being here in the film room, we're going to be diving into clips later, and so many of those clips are highlighted by your athleticism. And, you know, we're pumped as hell to have you. So, you know, I'm going to give you a silent clap. The floor is yours really quick. You know, we just appreciate the hell uh, out of yeah, you man, stopping by you. and taking the time. And yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Welcome to the show. No, of course. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, Ryan, you know, one of the things I want to first talk about is, uh, you know, the Bills, it was a different process for you this offseason, right? Early in the offseason, you're a restricted free agent. And there were opportunities almost came about where you were possibly going to Chicago you had visits with the Bears, supposedly Minnesota, and New England. Um, so talk about that process of, of going and meeting with those teams and uh, things that were maybe discussed in those meetings, especially like what position were you know these teams looking uh, for you to play? Yeah, so like you mentioned before, I visited with Chicago, I visited with Minnesota, and I visited with New England. And I got the opportunity to sit down with a lot of cool ball coaches. I got dinner with Belichick. That was cool. You know, how often do you get to have dinner with uh, one of the greatest coaches in football history? Um, so that was a cool opportunity. Um, you know, on, on all these visits, you know, really just talk ball. You know, got to get the get a feel for uh, each organization. And, you know, it was, like I said, it was a cool opportunity. Um, you know, not many people get the opportunity to do things like that. And I was very uh, grateful for the teams that had me. And but at the end of the day, I'm so damn happy I stayed with Buffalo. Um, and it all worked out in the end. And a lot of teams, uh, they, you know, I have the body type of a center, but they all played me. Uh, they wanted me at guard, uh, preferably right guard. Uh, really, every team I thought. I think New England maybe wanted me to play left, but um, not much conversation uh, got to be had with New England. But yeah, you know, and that like we, I, I joked about it in the lead in, and we're going to see it with you know several of the clips um, tonight. But your your versatility is just renowned at this point, especially amongst Bill's mafia. And I guess, you know, a, a question for me, you know, you go back to your time at Penn state, you know, you had three solid years of playing time. And in 2016, 578 snaps at left guard, 323 at left tackle, 2017, 520 snaps at left tackle, 67 at right tackle, 2018, 604 at left tackle, 275 at right tackle. So you see the majority of your snaps at tackle, at Penn state and you did very well accolades, honors, all that kind of stuff, playing for one of the top programs in the nation against top level competition. And then, you know, so kind of my question for you is what was the process like where you go from being a tackle with guard experience in college to this player who can fill in anywhere along the offensive line? Was that something that was kind of like a conscious decision as you approach the draft or when you signed into the league or when you were traded to the bills or did it kind of just happen organically, like throughout your journey in the NFL? Um, so like you mentioned before, I started my career, actually my first position, I played at Penn state, my red shirt. Yeah, I was a center. Um, okay. I never got any game time at center, uh, obviously. Okay. And so 2016 was my first year, uh, starting for Penn state. And I was at left guard, like you mentioned. And then I transitioned from tackle. There was an injury. I think we were playing Indiana in 2016. And, um, you know, I was, we didn't have a lot of tackles in depth and they just kind of, you know, they told me leading and in, going into the game. Uh, I got some reps at tackle. They made sure I got reps at tackle because the, I was the backup tackle, even though I was a starting guard. Yeah. And so Paris Palmer wound up tearing his ACLs. It was a freak. You know, the way it happened, it, was, it sucks. Because it was a non-contact ACL injury, ACL, ACL tear. <sighs> and he was just in his tick set. And, you know, at the top of the set, he turned. And it was just oh. – he turned weird. And so that was the debut of uh, me playing tackle in college. And then, I, you know, that became my home. Yeah, And then leaning into the NFL uh, post-college, 
Um, a lot of teams saw me as the body, like I mentioned before, the body type of a center. But, mm-hmm. you know, I wasn't going to play. I was always told I was too short, too, too short arms. My arms weren't long enough mm-hmm. to play tackle in the league. Um, and so I was always told I was going to be an interior once I got to the next level. And I agreed, you know, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, who wants to go against the Von Millers, the Miles Garrett's? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Screw that. I'll stay on the inside. Um, so, and I've been really been interior um, really the last two years. My first, mm-hmm. first year in the league, I was the really mainly tackle, but um, I got to play. Got a, I think I got a good amount of snaps at tackle in the, in the league. Uh, you know, I got some opportunities to put some film out and tackle. So, yeah. Yeah. We'll play a little bit of everything. Play some tight end, play some fullback. Have you ever caught a touchdown? I'm glad you mentioned tight end because they have tried yeah. sneaking you out a few times yeah. over the last couple yeah. of years. I'm Sneaky day, will try sneaking you out, but I'm, co- I'm convinced I might have set a record for most routes ran by a single offensive lineman in a single season. Oh, we um, should have tracked that before. That was, I a, think, that was I a think good I, one. I think I ran like 15 routes, uh, 20, 20, 2020. 2020, yeah. That's, that's, that's when I planned a lot of jumbo tight end. And, yep. Um, mm-hmm. Anytime on the goal line, I was like the jumbo tight end they threw in there and yeah, I ran a lot, of, a lot of routes, but zero targets. Never got the opportunity. <laughs> Tough. Well, I want to ask you, now that you're kind of more shifted towards the interior now and you kind of feel like you found a home there, there's a lot more emphasis on what you're doing in the trenches and you're in the thick of things in the run game. So I wanted to ask you really how you feel comfort-wise on the interior, but also the dichotomy of what the bills were doing from the early portion of the season towards the end, because at the early portion of the season, there was a lot of zone running going on. And then once you got your first start, a real significant game play, it was in week 16. And from that point on zone runs were only 31%. So my question to you is, do you think that the offense shifted to a gap scheme to favor your style of play? Or do you think it was more organic or matchup slash game plan specific? And if you had to pick one or the other to favor you, do you have a favorite run or uh, a zone scheme or a gap scheme? Yeah, so our base game plan we go into each week, it's it's solely the base the base run game plan that we have going into each week is, you know, who we play in that week, what kind of defense yeah. do they have? Mm-hmm. Um, it'd be silly to, to – revolve your offensive scheme, especially in the run game around a single offensive lineman. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, obviously you have skilled players like Josh, obviously, you know, the, the offense revolves around Josh. Like that Josh is an amazing athlete. He's an amazing quarterback. He's an amazing player. That's, you know, you can't even argue that. And so you can, rev- you can revolve your offense each game week around someone like that, but a single offensive lineman, you can't really, you know, make a game plan around that person. And so each, each uh, run game, plan we had going into each week was solely who we playing that week what's our mm-hmm. opponent what kind of defense do they have are they a zone are they a man you know are, are they weak on the edge are we going to be able to gash them up through the middle like that's how we we think table specifically really every office coordinator that's how they do their game plans each week and you know kind of to follow up on that um what do you think personally and this is your opinion what do you think uh, you talked about josh allen's style of play and the you know the bill's offensive uh style uh, under Dable, and obviously Ken Dorsey's coming in, and we're going to see some different things, but a lot of the base or foundation is there. Personally, what do you think is the the style of uh, game, uh, run game that kind of complements Josh's style, the offensive line style um, for th- this coming season? It, it, do you think it's very similar to last year? Do you think it's still going to be a game by game approach? But, or um, personally, what do you think is the the match for the high, you know, flying passing offense that we're used to seeing? Um, you know, last year we had a lot of success in the, the RPO world. You know, Josh had the option and, you know, you know, a lot of times Josh wants the, the ball in his hand. He's the playmaker. Sure. He's the, yeah. he's the captain. He's, he's the man. So, um, <laughs> like, like I mentioned before, a lot of things we're going to do each week is going to revolve around the game plan and who we're playing. Um, you know, like I mentioned before, zone, man, what kind of front do they run? Are they a three, four, are they a four, two, you know? That that each each game plan we do each week is going to be again really who we play in, like I mentioned before. And you know, I'm glad you mentioned like what the defense is showing, you know, kind of their base or their foundation on that side of the ball. Um, because you know, we're talking about your versatility and how many different positions you've played over the years. And I really want to show fans and, and break down uh how difficult that is, first of all, to do because it starts in you know with the film, it starts with your studying. 
and learning multiple positions. But more importantly, one solid protection like we see on the screen here, the 72-73 protection, you know, depending on what position you're at and depending on what front they show you when you get to the line of scrimmage, your assignment can obviously change. So walk us through, uh, you know, learning the different uh, assignments for each of these fronts because, I mean, there are only, what, eight different types of fronts shown here, but obviously there are a lot more that defenses show uh, at the NFL level. So talk about, you know, learning those assignments uh, uh, for multiple positions and maybe even kind of get into the weeds about how do you learn that? Is that just straight memorization? Mm -hmm. Do you use Q, like, you know, flashcards? Like, what's your process to learn multiple positions when you have so many different assignments at different positions? Yeah, so that's a good question. So the way we run our offense is a lot of code words. You know, it really is a lot of memorization. And given where I'm at in my career, being in the fourth year, really in not the same offense, it's not going to be the same offense we ran last year, but very similar and a lot of terminologies might be the same, mm, uh, right. but a lot of it's just repetition. You know, you just got to do it. You got you to get, you know, live reps in practice mm. and walkthroughs. You know, I, me I mentioned live reps. We don't get a lot of live reps in, like, you know, during a game week. You know, you have a limited number of reps, and you have to make the most of each rep. And so that's why walkthroughs are so important at this mm. level because it gives the opportunity to take the blow off our bodies but at the same time, get on the same page communication-wise. You know, in my career, I got the opportunity to play center early. You know, I really played tackle. I was the backup tackle my rookie year, but um, I played some reps at the center in practice. And I think my first preseason game as a Bill, I got I played center. Mm -hmm. And so I had to learn the offense pretty quickly, especially when I, when I got traded right. over uh, from Philly to Buffalo. I didn't have much time. I had a week to really learn the offense and play center in that, in that first preseason game. Mm -hmm. And so really once I got a great understanding, once you get a great understanding of center, you get a good understanding of guard. Once you get a good understanding of guard, mm -hmm. you get a good understanding of tackle, tackle, tight end. And so once I really honed in on that center position and, you know, learning what I need to do on each play and following my rules, everything else kind of fell in line in terms of, you know, center, guard, tackle, tight end. Right. And and you mentioned some of that practice reps and how you don't really get to obviously practice uh, all the positions uh, during each practice, but during a game week, um, what would you say like the percentage of like, let's use last year as a template, you know, when you played a lot of your, your you know, same position last year, um, what, you know, what type of percentages uh, during the game week uh, were you taking reps at guard versus center versus tackle? Like what percentages would you break it down to? Yeah, I would say I probably got 80% center, 20% guard. Mm. And, you know, I played, you know, both guards in practice, you know, yeah. you know, God forbid someone got hurt. I had to go yeah. in and right or left. Um, like I didn't really play a lot of tackle because we drafted Tommy and Spencer Brown. Mm. And we also had Daryl Williams and Deion. So sure. we had to talk, we had the tackle position covered. Uh, so I really, you know, honed in on that center guard spot, that interior uh, like you mentioned before, it became my home. Right. And uh, I would say 80-20, 80 center, 20 guard. Oh, wow. What, you know, within that, this, you know, we were talking offline uh, before the episode started, you know, and you were kind of giving us a peek behind the curtain into, you know, your off-season work and diet and regimen and all that kind of stuff. And I guess, I guess tied within that from a, like, off-season work, training, preparation standpoint, whatever verbiage you want to use, was it, different coming into this year knowing you kind of you know you still have that versatility within you but you have more at least to us it seems like you have more of a known position and role carved out for yourself being you know at that guard spot potentially at that right guard spot did that does that change anything for you knowing that you know maybe there's less jack of all trades coming into a season and more known like okay here's what my position is going to be does that change anything in which how you approach the off season or how you train or prepare or anything uh, no, I, I tried to have the, main, the same mindset as I have the past couple of years. This might be the first year in my career in the NFL where I might not be, you know, I, I don't want to say guaranteed a roster spot, but um, I'm not fighting for my life. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So being an undrafted rookie, I've always had that mindset where I got a chip on my shoulder, I got something to prove, and I still have right. something to prove. I, I mean, I meant like we talked about before we got on, I, I really changed this, this off season. I really got in my diet, leaning out. Um, I had a buddy who just got his PhD in sports science. I sat oh. down and talked with him. He wrote, he wrote a great training program, strength program. 
that I got to do a little bit that in our uh, when I'm home and not in Buffalo. And so, you know, I really wanted to work on that more explosive, you know, a lot of more plyometrics working into my, my training regimen. Um, and, you know, I keep going back to the diet. I, you know, I, I leaned out a lot. You know, I, I lost five, uh, 5.8% body fat, gained 16 pounds of muscle. I'm sitting at 305 right now. I feel great. And so, but I, I have the same mindset where I still have something to prove. I still want to be the best. Uh, right now, it might be my position to lose, but I hate, I hate, excuse my, excuse my French. I hate fucking losing. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you so, get a trophy for that, Ryan? You get a trophy for that percentage of uh, that loss there? I think I might. They didn't have one. I'm hoping I don't. <laughs> a pat on the back, asking, a sticker I'm on the wall. Yeah. I'm going to keep asking Shana for one, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I haven't got one yet. So hopefully they have one for me. You know, you j- just real quick, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, with how, with how you came into the league and then having to like feel like you have to fight for a roster spot like every season and, you know, you're still fighting. You have that chip as everyone should. Like that's how you continue to grow and progress mm-hmm. and all that. But how, how satisfying of, you know, I guess the, of the last like six, seven months, roughly, or maybe eight, nine, how satisfying has that been? You know, you come in to the Bills lineup you play well, the offensive line starts to click, you come into the off season, you're getting RFA offers, you got multiple teams courting you and taking you to dinner and whining and dining you and then teams kind of fighting for you a little bit. Is it nice to kind of be Cinderella with a glass slipper for a little bit instead of having to come into each off season knowing that like you're scrapping and clawing? I mean, of course it is, you know, you know, who doesn't like to be wine and dined? Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's a good opportunity for me to, you know, progress in my career and, Hmm. Um, say, say the question again I kind of got lost in my thoughts no yeah I mean I'm, I gave you a lot of compliments so it's fair just like is the the, the the change in mindset and like how good does it feel to have like you come into a season and it's less like you know you still have that chip but it's not as oh man another do or die season you've kind of ascended a little bit in terms of like your security in terms of this league and in your play like I just how how satisfying is that knowing that you, like you said, you've come from successive seasons of being like fighting and clawing and kind of live or die every year. It's very satisfying. Um, you know, it's, it's a great feeling, you know, getting the opportunity to, you know, be a starter and earn a starting role. And, you know, you hate the, I hate the, we, we were close, you know, we're a close knit group in our all line room, especially the past couple of years. And I hate to get the opportunity due to injuries, but you know, I, you know, I got my opportunity. I stuck with it. I learned, you know, I stuck with my, uh, my techniques. I stuck with, you know, what I knew. Um, and I feel like I made the most of it, and, but I still have more to prove. Yeah. And that's a solid way to look at it. Like no one ever wants to be satisfied and that's how you start to plateau and you stop that progression. But, you know, to build on that point, you showed well when, you know, you got into the line, if you did your thing and Eric, that transitions us right into the film part of the cover one film room where we're really going to dive into how Ryan, you know, really started to unlock versatility in the run and pass game because of his skill set and what he brought to the offensive line. Yeah. And, you know, we're going to talk, uh, we're going to see some plays uh, in the run game and the pass game. I wanted to start with a couple of plays in the run game, uh, specifically uh, this chiefs game and how Ryan's, you know, uh, athleticism. I mean, his RAS, if you guys are in RAS, um, relative athletic score is, is up there in the high nines. I believe, uh, if, uh, if I recall correctly, he's Correct. a very athletic guy, obviously plays multiple positions. And, and it, it was our belief that when he did get in the lineup, you know, the versatility, the diversity of the run and pass game kind of, um, flourished a little more than the other lineups that we saw prior to that with some of the other players. So we want to take a look at some of those plays, these first two plays, where QB runs, and this is one hell of a reach block by Ryan. He gives a silent call to Morse, and he's able to reach block Chris Jones here and allows Josh Allen to get on the perimeter. And, guys, this is important that he's able to make this uh, quick reach block because normally, you know, offenses to get the upper hand, whether it's a numbers advantage or just positional leverage, sometimes they're just going to end up, you know, down blocking right here on Chris Jones Mm -hmm. and having Ryan pull. Yeah. Well, that athleticism, that quickness by base here, allows him to seal off Chris Jones here. So Ryan kind of walk us through this play and uh, the monster that is Chris Jones. <laughs> yeah, of course. I mean, he's a beast. I mean, he's a big, big dude. Um, you don't realize how big he is until you, I mean, he's got like 
couple inches on me, and I'm I'm six five. I mean, yeah, I feel like he might be a six eight. I mean, he's a big wow. dude, like Godzilla. Um, but so I'm you know I'm gonna start off looking at the front. It's four down front. I'm looking at a three tech on my side. We're looking at a crack toss. I, I believe it's third and short. Mm-hmm. It is third and three. Third and three. So third down. I believe Chris Jones. He's thinking pass. You know, I got a two point. I got in a. I, I like to play a little psychological games with the people I'm playing against. Hmm. So I get I get in a two point stance, hoping he thinks he. You know, I want him to pass rush. Mm-hmm. You see him angled towards me. I know he's not going to blow smoke up the field. He's not a fast guy. He's not. He's not like a you know Ed Oliver who wants to blow smoke up the B gap and beat you with his speed. Mm-hmm. You see how he's angled. He's got his. I believe he's got his inside foot back. If you could rewind that. Yep. His inside foot back, his left hand's down. So his first step he has to take with his left foot. Huh. Uh, like I mentioned before, I'm in a two-point stance hoping he thinks it's pass. So I'm not super aggressive. You know, you know, if it was like second and 10, I'd be in a three-point stance. And my, my first step would be – my second step would be I'd definitely more through the line of scrimmage. Right. Mm-hmm. You see I'm kind of stepping sideways. I'm not mm-hmm. really kind of turning my shoulders yeah. uh, toward the sideline and as uh, like a, a reach block should be. And so, like I mentioned before, I like to play these psychological games with the defenders I'm playing against. And so, I take a fast lateral step, and I get that edge. Again, I'm focused on getting my helmet past his midline mm-hmm. on his on his his, his uh, outside shoulder. And once I get there, I'm really focused on locking that outside hand on. Mm-hmm. And he starts to lose. I start to lose leverage a little bit. You see, I bring my backside hand through. And so, I just try to lose use my athletic athleticism. And stay with them, mm-hmm. kind of pull them tight to me, lock, rip my backside hand through, and I get to you know, stay with them. Josh does a great job hitting that hole and covering the ball up, getting that first down. Yeah, and you know we're looking at another play here. This time you're on the backside, but again you're picking up um, a, a, a nose tackle on this play as Josh runs off to the right here. And maybe talk a little more about the footwork. Uh, I mean, this is uh, more of those you know, crack toss, pin and pull type runs, but. Talk about the footwork. Is there a specific landmark you're working to uh, with your footwork? Like a second step's got to be down the midline. Like what are you working to on this type of block here on the backside of this run? So this might be the exact play that we just watched for yep. Kansas City. It's a crack toss, crack toss to the right. The last one was to the left. So I, I'm the backside guard. I'm looking at a is he tight shade on Mitch. Yep. Mm-hmm. Blue shade. He's in the A-gap. Mm-hmm. It's the A-gap defender. My biggest emphasis in this block is my backside foot. I want to cross over with my backside foot because that's the quickest way to get from point A to point B, mm. especially on the outside zone. Because mm. if he goes back door, I mean, I, I'll let him go back door all day. Mm-hmm. I, I don't Exchange care. with him, yeah. yeah who cares? He's okay. not, I have Isaiah McKenzie in the backfield coming ahead. He's got used to that cross motion. So yep. I can really emphasize getting that back, back foot through. And because if he, if he sees Isaiah, he, if he runs with him, let him run with him. I don't care. Ball's right. going the other way. So I'm getting that crossing over that second step. And once I get my leverage, I'm just going to, I'm just going to keep him there. That, that's, that's what I'm thinking on this play. Right. And, you know, I love that you mentioned that crossover foot because for most people, that's, that's tough because you're crossing over, your pads are high mm-hmm. and a defensive lineman, especially a nose tackle could just, you know, blow you back. But because of how quick you are, you beat him off the snap and you're able to get that positional leverage, which with your quickness is your, it's your game. It's your forte, mm-hmm. you know that positional leverage, not necessarily the physical leverage on a defender. And like you said, once you get that positional leverage, you're able to seal it off. But I also love how you stay engaged and you, and you just ride him up the mm-hmm. field and uh, lets Josh obviously get upfield for a, a big play on this one. Oh, man. Ryan, quick question for you. We Last week when we when we had Mitch on, he was talking about um, – like the, the checklist as, you know, you guys come to the line and everything, you know, you're checking for and what he has yeah. individually and both as a group with, you know, you mentioned the psychological games thing. I, I find that super fascinating. Is that, do you have, is that part of like a checklist as you come to the line every time? Are you kind of making notes of like things you've done in previous reps against whoever's lined up in front of you? Or do you have kind of like a little log of like what you've done to, in, to the game at that point? Or like, are there, like, are you doing anything in game from a psychological perspective or is it more just kind of like a general rule that you kind of operate with on each snap in each game? So a lot of it, a lot of it is uh, watching film and okay. seeing what the tells are on each defender. You mentioned Mitch, Mitch has his checklist, you know, as a center, you come to the line, you call the front four down, three down, load diamond um and then you if it's a protection you you know who are we going to we call a number 
And from a protection standpoint, that's the checklist. Yep. You know, sometimes you look at his cover two, you know, that might change who we're IDing on certain plays. Mm-hmm. I have a little checklist in my head. I like to, if I'm playing against a guy who, you know, some people have tells when they're pirating, you know, they're spiking inside or they might run mm-hmm. games, you know, if, you know, it's third and long and he gets super wide and some, mm-hmm. you know, some guys only rush, you know, tight, you know, when they're three tech, they like to rush, you know, tight and they're angled toward the quarterback. Mm-hmm. When they get super wide, you know, that kind of gives you a tell, you know, a game might be coming, a little DE, maybe ET. Mm. Um, and, you know, people who are pirating or spiking, they might get real square. They might have, you know, sometimes with their pass rushing, most of the time if they're pass rushing, they're getting a three-point stance and their inside foot will be back up and they'll be back. And when they get real square and they get a four-point stance, that's an immediate sign that I, I know they're pirating. I know there's some kind of stunt coming. Mm. Um, if their stance gets real narrow, you know, I think uh, is it Williams with the Jets, he gets real narrow with his stance every time he. You kind of owned him. You kind of owned him in that <laughs> second meeting, too. I'll say that I posted a bunch of those clips uh, during the season. You had him, I mean, you had him mystified because he was coming with so much power and you were just, your hand placement, your hand quickness was just, it, it caught him off guard. I don't think he was expecting that type of level of play from you in that game, to be honest. Yeah, he's a, he's a big dude. Uh, one of the things I like, you know, doing pass protection, one of the techniques that I do, I use to my advantage is I use, I use a little cup technique where I try to grab their, their shoulder pads right here on the collar. Uh-huh. And due to the fact that I might not be the biggest guy on the field, I'm 305, so I'm the defense alone, and I'm going against, it might be 330, 320. Mm-hmm. You know, they might be just bigger and stronger than me. I can't control that. And so I use my technique to my advantage. Mm-hmm. We have an assistant online coach, Ryan Window, who Rindle, isn't yeah. super big. You know, six three. I think he played at like two ninety, and that was one of the techniques that he taught me. And you know, he does a great job of teaching me little, little, little tricks of the trade that right. he used in his his day. That you know, being an undersized guy, and you know, just using that that little technique, and then extending your arm, and then using the leverage against the defender. Like, because obviously, like if someone's running into you. I don't want my my arm bent because if my arm's bent, he's just going to keep running into me, running yeah, into maybe. me. Yeah. I want to lock that out. I want to create extension, and I'm going to use that leverage to my advantage. And so that's one of the techniques I actually used against him, um, against Williams, just being given a bigger guy. And, you know, Lawrence Guy with the New England Patriots, I was against him. And, yeah. You know, that's one of my things that, you know, I really incorporated in my game that really helped me out a lot. Now, you had mentioned film and what you saw in film and some of those, you know, uh, things that you, you pick up on. Now, what is your your film process when you're watching film going into, you know, the week? Like, do you have a specific routine on what guys you watch? Uh, you kind of talked about what you look for, but like, what's your routine to 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 watch film on who you're playing against that that coming week? So usually a coming week, a coach will give us your line. The online coach will give us, uh, you know, good games to watch, you know, first mm-hmm. opponents that mm-hmm. something we might do. You know, we might have a scheme that week that an opponent did against them, you know, a couple of weeks back. And so he'll give us, you know, good games to watch. And, you know, I'll watch those games, you know, from play one to play 80 or however, how many snaps that might be in a single game. And then I'll watch the full game. And then after that, I'll go to the third down cutups. Mm-hmm. You know, any, any kind of third down or pass rush situation, I'll watch what their pass rush moves are. If they have any tells in their pass rushes, you know, and I might watch three or four games. And then I'll watch the third down rushes for each of those games. And then I'll watch who I might be going against up that week. Who plays, you know, some defenders on the D-line might only play on the right side. Some might only play on the left side. Mm -hmm. You know, it all depends on, you know, who you're playing against that week, what kind of defense, Mm -hmm. what kind of scheme they run. And so that's kind of, you know, I'll start with that. And then I'll look at little... You know, tidbits I mentioned against before, Williams with the Jets, he gets real narrow. Mm -hmm. You know, I I start to pick out some of those things I might see when we play him. You know, Grady Jarrett is another Mm -hmm. one of those people in Atlanta who he's got tells when he gets stance stance gets real narrow anytime he's spiking in. And I know if I'm passing against them, I don't got to go nowhere. I know Mm -hmm. he's coming to me. So I'm not going to set all the way out in him and give him a giant A gap to run through. Mm -hmm. All right. So. That's that's a little, you know, I'll watch a full game and then third round push cut ups and then I'll watch the base, you know, first and second down plays and you know the run game and how they play it. If you know, if it's a two gap team, they might, you know, it's you know, we play New England Patriots, they got right here. Mm-hmm. They're yeah. a two gap team and they're gonna yep. 
there's they, some of them sit in that frog stance and they're just going to attack you with your hands. And there are mm-hmm. different techniques that you use against whether they're two gappers, whether they're penetrators, there's certain techniques that you use in the run game and the pass pro, you know, what are you going to do against them that week? Okay. Um, so I, the next thing I want to talk about, we're going to get into some of the film here, but I want to show this clinic from your former offensive line coach, Bobby Johnson. Um, it, it, Cause it really kind of encompasses like, what teams were trying to do against you guys last year, you know, playing a lot of those two high shells, uh, only rushing four. Now, which four they were sending at you, I mean, was the, the biggest question because a lot of teams ran in some of those creeper and simulated pressures. You talked about yeah. Grady Jarrett. Um, we, we broke down some film with Mitch last week about him and how he was spiking inside on some of those uh, nickel rushes off the edge. Um, so I want to talk about how teams did do that a lot and how they ran those stunts. You mentioned the Pirates on nice three-man stunt. Um, but I want to go back to this play from the Patriots game um, where you were only playing. I think you only played one drive, but it was a it was a hell of a play on this on this uh, uh, clip that Bobby Johnson is breaking down. Um, you have a guy head up over you. Um, so I want everyone to kind of listen in to Bobby Johnson break this down. Then we're going to go back uh, to square one and uh, pick up this play from the beginning and have Ryan take a look at it. Here's that Bates guy again. So you've seen him take a snap at left tackle earlier all right there'll be a clip later on where he's at guard and now here he is at center mitch you know got a concussion this game and i tell the kid you know hey go in you're going to center look at him right here snap stab create space like it'd be a little bit square but he does a good job of flatting the guy off and we'll talk about this drill that we work later on of snapping a defender over and then getting the looper and being in a good position on the looper but that's a great job look at the depth of the pocket Oh, get kicked off there. Hold that's on. how that's how good that play was. That it just <laughs> shut huddle down. Like the footwork was too much. The athleticism was too much for the for the program to handle. <laughs> All right, so let's actually take a look at the play, Ryan. That was the end of the clip, anyways. Um, you know, teams are trying to get Josh Allen off the spot, right? You're like they didn't yeah. want to blitz him because he's so good against the blitz. He's he's got really good weapons and sight adjustments to get the ball to them. Um, so I want you to break this play down for us, walk us through your checklist, walk us through the process here at center, uh, against this front and, uh, really kind of get us uh, behind the curtain here on, uh, what happened on this play uh, on this little, uh, loop that the Patriots were trying to run. Yeah. So this is a little, this is the empty protection. I believe it's might be 72 protection. The thing that you showed earlier. Um, so I look at how many defense linemen on the field. I see one, two, three, four, and they're in a load front, you know, Right. Uh, I think I think fifty one fifty one's a linebacker. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, so, um, get because it's a an empty protection. We have five guys on the line of scrimmage. We're going to take all five. The, uh, I believe that's Motor in the backfield. He's got no responsibility. Or that might be yeah. uh, Zach. It's Zach. Yep. Either way, he's got no responsibility in protection. He's on his route. So we have five for five, in essence. Butler, I'm looking for that's that's my checklist. So I'm looking at. How many, how many D linemen on the field? What formation are they in? What kind of front? And then I'm honing in to who's lined up across from me. I believe right. this is Butler, who's now – I think he's – is he still in Miami? I'm I not think sure. so. That's a good question. We he, talked he, about he, him last week. He, he's uh, – we talked about with Mitch. He's an underrated very player. Very underrated. Yes, very yeah. underrated player. Yeah. Uh, he does a great job at the zero technique, getting that edge on, on most centers. You see how he grabs – he tries to grab that back that, that back side of the shoulder and yeah, rip that, pull through, yeah. Rip that rip that backside hand through. He does a great job of that. He's 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 so his job right here is penetrating that A gap. He wants to get on that guard's hip. Mm-hmm. And I don't want him to get on the guard's hip. I'm gonna create <laughs> as much extension. So I'm as a center, he's lined up, you know, he's dead, dead down the center of me. Mm-hmm. First foot I talked about earlier. Mm-hmm. First foot he's gotta step with is what foot? That back foot. Yep. I know he's stepping here, so I'm going to step with my back, my my right foot because I know he's stepping with his left foot. You got to match it, and then I'm going to ma- I'm going to match what he's yeah. I'm going to mirror him basically, mm-hmm. and then once he picks a direction, he's got he's got to commit one way or the other, and whatever whatever way he commits, I want to create extension because I know is it is there a down or distance? I no, I don't have it actually. No. Nope. So, let's say it's a it's a passing it's a passing down. It might be mm-hmm. third and five, third and six. Second and ten, so I'm going to create as much extension as possible to pass off the defender to the uh, the adjacent offensive lineman next to me. Right, and then after that, once I 
once I'm 100% sure that I've passed off my defender to my guard, I want to lag the, 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 loop, the looper. I want to lag him. Right. I don't have to go. I don't have to rush anywhere because I know he's, he's, he's coming running, to you. He's running sideways. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm going to let him run sideways. He's not, he's not penetrating at all. And so I want to stay on his inside shoulder. And after that, it's just really just hand fighting and locking him down, you know, mirroring him. Yeah, no, this is a, a great play. Again, uh, you know, I, I'm pretty sure it's an obvious passing situation. Empty protection, five on five here. Um, and Bobby Johnson talked about flattening Butler out and how important that was and snapping off uh, that that pass rush from Butler uh, to the, the adjacent guard there. And then getting your eyes, keep your head on the swivel and getting your eyes on that looper because, you know, if that guy is, uh, you know, stunning inside, spiking out into the, to the, towards the guard there, um, that someone is going to come to you. But this is, again, Ryan, this is where that athleticism um, on top of the, the stuff from the shoulders up that uh, football intelligence of knowing that and sensing that a looper is coming back and not over uh, compensating uh, Butler as he rushes upfield, um, staying home and then just letting that guy come to you, letting that looper come to you. Um, it, it really helped the Bills secure the depth of the pocket. We talked about it last week, guys. Interior guys, centers and guards are generally – uh, setting the depth of the pocket with the tackle, setting the width of the pocket. So just a really nice mm-hmm. play from you here. Appreciate that. Ryan, question for you. With how – like this this protection is beautiful. Josh has a nice, clean pocket, alleyways, windows to like execute and throw through. With – you know, one of the things we've highlighted in his game from 2021 was his pocket manipulation, his awareness in the pocket, and just everything that he did. And that's not the same, obviously, for every quarterback. And, you know, granted, offensive line, like you have your basic set of rules and pass protection, which is at the end of the day, like don't let the quarterback get hit, don't let the quarterback be sacked. But based on the type of quarterback you have behind you, whether it's whether they're athletic, whether they're more cerebral, whether they're more like a statuesque pocket passing type of quarterback, how much do you as a group like tweak your styles or kind of like your execution plan up front based on the kind of quarterback that you have behind you. Does it change at all knowing like the type of skill set you have behind you, or is it just kind of, you know, minor tweaks and, you know, here and there? No, I, I wouldn't really say, you know, my job at the end of the day is keeping my defender off the quarterback. Mm-hmm. And that's not going to, my job is not going to change based off the person, you know, whoever's got the ball behind me. Yeah. You know, does it help me a lot that I have Josh Allen behind mm-hmm. me? There, who's a freak athlete and he's a great quarterback and he is um he's so so smart reading coverages and just feeling this pocket presence presence and him feeling whichever way he's getting pressured he does a phenomenal job and he makes my job easier i always mm-hmm. said that he makes my job easier yeah and but i wouldn't say the the way i play off its line determines on who's behind me who's got the ball mm-hmm. in his hands i, I wouldn't say because at, at the end of the day like i said i gotta keep my guy off of Josh. Right. Is there any, I, I, and let me rephrase, is there anything more like, are there things that you know, like, okay, Josh likes to do this or Josh likes to scramble this way or evade this way. So maybe I try to push my guy here or do this, try and like, you know, factor into that at all. Does that ever come into play? Uh, not much, not in pass protection. Okay. Uh, some aspects of which game plan we're running during the week. He might have, you know, I'm not going to tell you, but well, no, there course, are yeah. some things. I'm not expecting favor. the trade secrets. Right, yeah. right, right. There are some things he'll favor and that I know that he might go one way or the other if, you know, if it's a certain play. Um, or a certain protection too, right? Yeah. Obviously, yeah. knowing that, you know, five-man protection, if it's man, a five-on-five, a, um, you know, a five-o blocking scheme, kind of like we saw in that 72-73 protection and that Patriots game. Um, you have an idea, hey, especially if you see man coverage, possibly man mm-hmm. coverage, like, hey, there's a good chance he could take off on 30 and mm-hmm. four to six, right? I mean, mm-hmm. some of those things pop up situationally. Yeah. You know, what's great about Josh is, you know, I've, I've been, you know, as a tackle, you know, I've, I played tackle, obviously, you know, we, we watched some clips earlier uh, with me playing tackle. And I talked earlier about, you know, being tackle in college. When you have a quarterback that's standing 11, 12 yards in the pocket, that sucks as a tackle. <laughs> right. That sucks. <laughs> Josh does a great job of that. Well, he'll stand at seven or eight yards. Mm-hmm. And that that gives the tackles, you know, they can run their guy up the field not worrying Josh is going to be standing at 12 yards of the pocket. Mm-hmm. Right. Because as a, as a tackle, I'm thinking I got to 
I'm thinking I have a 10 yard bubble. That's mm-hmm. the way I think about it. A tackle. Mm-hmm. I have a 10 yard bubble. If Josh is standing at past 10 yards, you know, we had, uh, when I was in, in with the Eagles, Jeff Statlin, you know, if he said the quarterback Great was standing, coach. if he was standing at 11 yards, he's like, that's not on you. That's on him. Right. Yeah. There's like, only so why much. Is he sta- why is he standing? An easy target. In the pocket? Why is he standing right. 12 yards deep in the pocket? That defensive end has to go somewhere. And he, if he keeps running up the field, there's only so, so much I can widen him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, if the quarterback's so, too deep, that changes the angle on his path yeah. to the quarterback. So it makes it easy. Josh does a great job of helping our tackles out, not standing super deep. He's like mm-hmm. I said, he stands seven, eight yards, but that puts a little bit more strain on the interior of the pocket. The mm-hmm. centers and guards, right? They have to be a little bit more firmer, and that's where our aggressive pass, set, pass sets come in. You know, mm-hmm. a lot of guards. I, you know, there's some there are some teams in the NFL where they'll set back, uh, not us. We'll, we'll, I'm going to aggressive pass that you, especially given, you know, like I mentioned earlier, my stature, sure. I'm not the biggest guy on the field. I'm going to, I'm going to be, I'm going to be the aggressor. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, pass setting is not passive. Uh, I always tell mm-hmm. people that it's not passive. It, it's active. Mm-hmm. And I want to be as gre- aggressive as possible. I want to get on my, I'm going to get on the defender before he gets on me. Mm-hmm. And like I mentioned, I want to get in here. Yeah. I just want to, I'm, I'm going to be the aggressive. I'm going to get in there right away and then if i'm if i if i miss it i gotta hand replace it i gotta i gotta hand fight um but it puts a little bit more strain on the interior of the pocket due to the fact that josh does stand at a, a, he i mean that's that's a sweet sweet spot eight yards deep in the pocket that's a sweet spot for a quarterback in my opinion you know i don't play quarterback so what the hell do i know right. um <laughs> well you could you're an athlete <laughs> i like you i like you man. i like you uh, and that's that's the thing. A lot of people don't understand. You know, fans don't understand that certain protections, kind of like what we saw there, usually have a framework. Hey, this is a three step drop. This is part of the quick game. This is a five step drop. Um, now, some of those things can change depending on the down and distance and stuff. Um, and quarterbacks also can ad lib the depth of the mm-hmm. drop. But Josh, as you said, has gotten better because there were times early in his career he liked to escape out the back of the pocket, kind of mm-hmm. drop too deep. So he has definitely progressed in that area. So. I want to talk about uh, third-party grading. I want to talk mm. about, you know, you guys come after a game on a Monday or, uh, or Tuesday, depending on when you guys play, and you sit down in the film room, probably with your positional coaches, and you go over some of the film, kind of wrap up that game before moving on to the next one, and you, you probably get some kind of grade on that. You probably get ripped in the film room and, and about things that you could have done better. Um but there are a lot of companies out there that grade you guys as third party, don't understand your assignments, don't really care what your assignments are. All they see is that you just blew a block or appeared to blow a block. So I want to get your thoughts on third party grading and, uh, you know, the accuracy of them. And uh, is that something that you pay attention to or some maybe just cross your timeline as you're browsing on a Monday? <laughs> yeah, right. not, at all. not at all. I know people who, you know, religiously watch like, PFF, you know, that's one of the instances where you, you know, talk about third party grading. Uh, I mean, I could care less about, you know, what people think that's not in our organization. Like the only thing that I care about is, you know, my, my position coach, my offensive coordinator, my head coach, and the, the person who writes my check every week. Right. I could give, I, I could give a crap who, you know, whoever's on Twitter, if I, you know, talking on Twitter, <laughs> you know, you know, someone might not be happy about a play, you know, you know it is what it is. Oh man, that's we we go back except and forth. For, except when you're you cover know. one, you know, cover one. Know <laughs> there we go. They know their shit. Checks in the mail. Checks in the mail. <laughs> well played. Well played. Uh that oh uh Johnny. Got, I was gonna say, Ryan, we have a rule here. So anytime, so th- this is a super chat. We get these live donations. Anytime we get one, we have to stop whatever we're doing, kind of read it, announce it, and go through. So base motel. Yeah, this is uh, – John's fantastic. He's uh, one of our – as he mentions every time, he's a Bills fan. He lives in Miami Beach. He's behind enemy lines, but he's a constant supporter. He's awesome. Um, and so, one, John, thank you very much for Super Chat. Thank you for the donation. Thank you for being here. And also for the comment, which I'm guessing is going to be something positive. He says, cover man, one – Oh, look at that, John. You had Mitch Moore shouting out last week. Now you got Ryan Bates. Man, you're just crushing it. John says cover one is the best Bill show on the web. Uh, old man, Bill's fan, behind enemy lines, Miami Beach. Love these O-line, D-line, trench warfare shows. Love Ryan's game. He takes these defensive tackles to the Bates Motel and <laughs> RIPs them. 71, blessings to you. Let's go. Fantastic. Thank you, John. Thank you, Johnny. Appreciate it. 
Man, and that's honestly that's a perfect and natural segue to you know us kind of wrapping up this episode of the Cover One Film Room, which. You know, thank you very much to everybody in the live chat. Thank you for the engagement, the questions, thoughts, comments, concerns, everything. You guys make us what we are. So we appreciate the hell out of you tremendously. Eric, as always, thank you. Kendall, as always, thank you. But I think it's pretty obvious that all three of us were overshadowed by our guest tonight, Mr. Ryan Bates, who we are tremendously happy is back in Buffalo. And just kind of as like people who want to see other people succeed, you know, it's awesome to see you, you had such a, <laughs> that's funny for John. John loves you. Uh, he's been blowing up yeah. the chat talking about how big of a fan <laughs> he is John. Um, of you, but yeah, you know, it's awesome to see, I guess I'll, I'll speak for myself personally, but I feel like it's a sentiment that a lot of people would echo. Like it's awesome to see these guys come from, like guys like yourself who succeed in college, but then kind of have to start, you know, a little bit all over again in the NFL. Mm-hmm. And then you continue to grind and climb and continue to claw. And now you secured more of like a, a, a of a starting potential starting position i'm very superstitious knock on wood starting position for yourself and you've attained the success and you know you're kind of riding the high of it and for you to take the time out of your yeah, off season amazing. for such a big season for the bills yeah. and such a big season for yourself for you to take the time you know and sit down with us and talk technique and scheme and just talk ball in general like we're tremendously grateful and tremendously appreciative of you uh taking the time to join us tonight so thank you very much of course you know, thank you, gentlemen, for having me. You know, I really appreciate it. And who doesn't love sitting down and talking ball? That's right. And that's that's what we do here on the Cover One Film Room. And if you didn't believe us before, now you got an endorsement from another Buffalo Bills player and Mr. Ryan Bates. And that's going to do it for us here on this episode of the Cover One Film Room. Please subscribe to the Cover One Film Room. Please subscribe to the Cover One channel as a whole. If you're listening on any one of the podcasting apps or platforms, please rate and review and subscribe there as well. We will be uh, live at Buffalo Bills training camp on Sunday, July 24th. Want to meet up with us, DM us, get at us on Twitter anyway and every way. And then also the night before, Saturday, July yeah, 23rd at 8 p.m. at Uncle Jumbo's down in the city of Buffalo. We'll be doing a live meetup with a majority of the crew. Get at us at the DMs. Meet us up for that as well. We love the engagement, interaction with, with the fans and the community. Anything and everything. More to come as we get closer to those dates on Twitter, on the socials, in the premium Slack channel. And for myself, for Mr. Eric Turner, for Mr. Kendall Mursky, for Mr. Ryan Bates, this has been an awesome episode of the Cover One Film Room. We hope you and your family and friends and loved ones are all doing well. Take care of one another. Be kind to one another. We will see you next week. And as always, go Bills. Go Bills.